Archangel Chronicles 2 Chapter 4 Monsoon by Raymond Collati, copyright 2024, all rights reserved. We made our way back to the palace. The heat of the day had reached its peak. The very effort of breathing sapped all energy from our very bones. Not a single man, woman or child or beast moved in the fetid air. The skies were empty of birds and on the ground dogs, cats and even monkeys in the trees would not move from the shade. We lay in our litter, motionless, covered in sweat, as our bearers struggled to keep moving on the road back to the palace. All the freshening sea breezes had stopped, and the waters subsided into a glassy smoothness. It was as if all the world was holding its breath. The heat, said Camilla, wiping her brow. Is it always like this in the summer? How do your people thrive in this weather? We tolerate the heat at this time of year, my lady, because we hope the gods of the winds and the rains will soon fill the air with refreshment. I sense it now. You shall see. A great change is coming. I looked to the south. A dark line of billowing clouds was growing ever closer. Soon they were overtopping us and casting long shadows. The sunlight shifted from a harsh glare to a soft greenish hue filtered through the cloud tops. I gave an order and our litter stopped. I got out and faced the south with my arms wide open, then turned to my guests. Come, my ladies, see and feel the power of the monsoon gods. We are to be delivered from the oppression of the sun. Come out and embrace the transformation which is upon us. We stood in front of the litter, facing south. A rushing sound in the distance, accompanying the towering and roiling rain clouds, grew ever louder, and the air changed. A great wind flung the curtains of the litter open, flapping the drapery like flags in a gale. I began to dance, flinging my arms to the heavens as the great wind swept by us, stirring the earth, the waters, and the heavens before it. The heat fell away before the wind, and a delicious coolness filled the air, lifting the spirit of men and beast alike. The earth had exhaled its life-giving breath at long last. Sophia stood, turning in circles, looking to the sky as massive white clouds with dark black bottoms shrouded the sun. Lightning began to flash, and the deep growl of thunder rumbled up through the air. Camilla lifted the folds of her garment over her head, shivering at the sudden drop in temperature. Great King! What is happening? She exclaimed, hands to her face. The rains began, drenching all of us. All thoughts of the oppressive heat were now a thing of the past. Vayu has sent this gift, my friends, I said, laughing around like a child, splashing my feet in puddles and opening my upturned mouth to taste the rain. This is renewal. This is life. This is nourishment from the breast of the gods. We re-entered the litter, drying ourselves and laughing together. Great king, tell me about these winds and rains, said Sophia. These are the monsoons, my lady. The god of the rains and winds, Vayu, sends them to us each year at this time after spring turns to the heat of summer. 
but we never know exactly when they will appear. Seers and wise men watch for the signs. We have been expecting them. My royal peacocks in the garden of the palace have begun their courting. The stately dance of the males around their mates comes just before the rains begin. We live in the grip of the rains, my ladies. Our land and people rejoice in the coming of the monsoons or spend the rest of the time waiting for its return. The harvests depend upon the rhythm of these rains. In our lands, great king, our great river, the Nile, swells and floods in the summer, bringing water and silt to replenish our crops. So it has been for ages and ages past, said Sophia. Such are the rhythms of the rivers of life. But the clouds can be fickle and may tease us, I said. Sometimes the clouds break up, the rains may dry up, but then they can appear again. It may rain for days on end non-stop, and when the rains leave our lands and forests and fields are transformed. Flocks of birds, cranes, and cormorants fill our skies. Summer is the season of the shifting winds of rebirth and promise. But the rains, like tyrants, also punish. They bring life to the land, but chaos and destruction as well. Rivers swell, sweeping away man and beast alike. We have learned to live with this chaos and must embrace it. Without these rains, the great river would dry up, the rice crops would fail, and all would wither and die. This is our lifeblood. Your river Indus, like our Nile, is a river of life. All would be desert without them, said Sophia. I would see your great river, my lady. Perhaps, someday, you will take me there. I could see Sophia blush deeply as she turned her head to look out the litter window. It rained for seven days and nights without stop. The waters of the great river swelled and the low areas were flooded. Roads became impassable, but then there was a break in the weather. The rains ceased, the clouds disappeared, and the sun reappeared, drying the land and beating down with renewed intensity. I summoned the Romans and my own generals. We must make preparations and strike the enemy now, before the rains resume. I sent my scouts out to the north. They returned within two days and reported that the enemy fleet had seized several villages on the coast and beached their ships twenty strong. They were stockpiling supplies. Aziz had appeared with his regiments. Honorius had been wise and correct in his assessment. I readied my phalanxes, my war elephants and cataphracts. To avoid detection, we made forced marches at night by moonlight and hid in the forest nearby the enemy camp, awaiting the Roman fleet. Aziz was not careful. Thinking that his rescue and supplies would come by sea, he neglected his landward defenses and his pickets and scouts did not venture far from their camp. We were not detected. My army was ready. At dawn the next day, ten war galleys of the Roman fleet, mastless and stripped for battle, appeared in the distance. Sentries, perched on the highest trees, saw them approach and take station off the shore, facing the beached ships of the enemy fleet. I turned to my chamberlain. Now, Pecores, let us strike and end this war. Spring upon them we will like a tiger. Great horns were sounded and drums beat out signals. My phalanx, 10,000 strong, stepped out from the forest and assembled in their regiments before the enemy camp. The enemy was thunderstruck. A line of fifty war elephants, with thickets of archers perched 
in wicker towers on their backs, charged the makeshift walls of the enemy camp. The elephants thrashed their terrible heads, tearing down the hastily constructed barriers, slashing with tusks armed with curved blades and demolishing those walls and terrifying the surprised guards. It quickly turned into a slaughter. Fire arrows rained down upon thatched roofs and the phalanxes moved together like a scythe toward the line of beached ships. Chaos reigned as my cavalry cut the enemy down as they tried to flee the onslaught. The enemy ran for their ships, giving up any attempt to hold their base. From atop my royal elephant, the tallest of all, I surveyed the carnage and watched as the fire arrows now rained down on the decks of beached enemy galleys. First one went up in flames, then another, and yet another. Six were lost to the enemy this way, and three more were in flames as their crews rowed out to sea feverishly. They did not get far. As the flames crept up the masts, the crews leapt into the water like fleas abandoning a drowning rat. It did not take long for my elephants and cavalry to gain the beach. Waters turned red from the slaughter, but the bulk of the enemy fleet escaped the shore, only to encounter the fast-moving line of Roman ships, sleek and maskless, bearing down upon them at full war. The pirate fleet had no time to form up. They were moving sluggishly into the teeth of an ever-freshening wind, which was at the Romans' packs, propelling their galleys forward, adding to their speed. The well-drilled crews drew their oars in unison, accelerating to top speed. Distant drums from the Roman ships sounded cadence, and they swept in at full ramming speed. Three of the Roman ships were through the gaps in the pirate line in a flash, where they stopped and pivoted 360 degrees. They fell upon the sterns of the fleeing pirate triremes, spearing them with their rams, after raking their decks with volleys of scorpion bolts. Six pirate ships sank by the stern quickly, leaving no time for their wretched crews, chained below deck, to escape. Their screams pierced the air. The Roman Liburnae, sleek and fast like greyhounds, darted in and out of the disintegrating pirate line, severing it into many pieces. The pirate ships wallowed in the water, shifting one way and then another, trying to find a way out of the ordeal. Two Roman Liburnae snagged several of the enemy ships using grappling hooks shot from ballistae. These Roman ships reversed direction, drawing the two larger enemy ships together, making it impossible for them to maneuver. Another Roman ship attacked these entangled hulks, and throwing clay pots filled with bitumen, naphtha, and sulfur onto the deck, fire arrows rained down, igniting the entangled ships. The screams of the doomed crews pierced the air, spreading more fear and panic amongst the remaining galleys. One by one, the remaining enemy ships made a run for the open sea, pursued by the swifter Romans. In short order, the entire pirate's fleet was sunk or on fire, hopelessly entangled or boarded and captured by Roman marines and rowers making short work of the enemy crews. By the time the sun reached its zenith on that day, it was over. Four enemy triremes were boarded, their crews slaughtered, and were under tow by the Romans back to Barbaricum. It was a complete victory. My phalanges clashed their shields with their sarissas, and great horns blared notes of triumph as we progressed back to Barbaricum with scores of prisoners who had chained and bowed, submitted to my will. My armies had swept all before them. For a dozen years, I had campaigned with my phalanxes, war elephants and cavalry up and down the lands of the Indus, 
From the foothills of the Hindu Kush, the roof of the world, down to the sea. City after city had fallen, submitted or been reduced to ashes. Aziz was the last of the petty kingdoms to defy my will. There was none left to oppose us. I had sacrificed much in my quest to unite the lands of the Indus. All of our efforts, all of our resources, were spent campaigning or preparing to campaign. There was no time to plan for peace. There was no time to find love, to marry, and see my children and heirs come into this world. These constant wars were acts of destruction. Now it was time to build, to harvest, to delight in the ways of peace. These were my thoughts as my army made its way back to Barbaricum, shouted by the Roman galleys at sea, towing the prized enemy triremes captured during the battle. My thoughts turned now to the future, and those thoughts were filled with the Lady Sophia. I could command armies and rule my subjects with decrees, but knew that no command no statements of my wishes or desire could bring her to my side. She had to be won over, and I ached to make that happen, while knowing at the same time that it may never come to be. I rode atop my great white war elephant, Piku, as we passed through the gates of Barbaricum, now thrown wide open to welcome us. The streets were garlanded with flowers and silken banners as we marched through, parading the captured prisoners, chained and miserable, behind us. Up the narrow streets we marched, drums sounding, hobnailed boots beating out a cadence on the cobblestones. The buildings alongside the route of our parade were festooned with many colors, but the populace stood sullen and silent, arms folded, watching our progress. It would take some time to get them used to being ruled by a new overlord. The Roman fleet arrived with four captured prize ships of the enemy fleet. They anchored and their crews came ashore. I sat waiting for them atop my elephant. The marine cohort marched its way up the streets from the harbor. My courtesans and Sophia, dressed in dazzling white gowns, fluttering agreeably in the wind, and her formidable guardian Camilla bowed as they passed before me. We all turned to wait the arrival of Honorius, riding his horse, but something was wrong. The tribune, Calius, walking bareheaded, approached us with downcast eyes. Behind him were four legionnaires, each carrying a handle of a stretcher, bearing a prone figure, dressed in armor and wrapped in a red military cloak. The long line of marine legionnaires marched behind the stretcher, somber and silent, carrying their commander, victorious but stricken in battle. Sophia let out a cry and ran forward, followed closely by Camilla, who seized her arm and held her back. Sophia turned and buried her face in Camilla's embrace, collapsing in sobs. Servants ran forward to help the Romans and Greek women back to the palace. I commanded my war elephant Piku to kneel as the procession pulled up. I descended from my mount and went over to the stretcher. Honorius lay unconscious but alive. His chest was heaving and he was struggling to take in air. The shaft of an arrow protruded from his armpit and I heard a sucking sound as he attempted to breathe in. This was serious. It was a punctured lung. He was covered with blood which pooled on the stretcher and formed a crimson rivulet snaking down his outstretched arm and dripping from his fingers. Procuries, send for our physicians. 
See that they do all they can for this valiant commander, I called. Servants sprang into action, removing Honorius from the stretcher and bearing him through the gates of the palace. I looked to Calius. He was stricken with grief. His blackened face was streaked with rivers of tears and sweat. Calius, take heart, my friend. Your commander is still with us. My best physician, skilled in treating such wounds, will administer to him. Come, all is not lost, for today we have won a great victory. Songs will be sung and stories told of the swift and gallant Roman squadron sweeping our enemies from these shores. Calius looked at me and nodded, too spent and emotionally drained to say another word. For three days, Honorius teetered on the edge of the nether world. I visited him often and did my best to comfort Sophia and Camilla. They would not leave his side. My physicians did manage to cut the arrowhead from the wound. His lung had indeed been pierced, and all the wound was cauterized and sutured with great skill and dressed with honey and propolis. His life hung in the balance. It was a grievous wound, and Honorius would never regain his strength and vigor, even if he survived, nor would he ever be able to wield a sword with that stricken arm. But there was still hope of a recovery. I realized Honorius was more to Sophia than a mere patron and sponsor. There was an emotional attachment which drove her to remain at his side day and night. Thoughts crossed my mind. What connection did these two have with the legate. Was he her lover? That did not seem to fit. More than that, I thought. No, it was more than that, I thought. Honorius was fatherly and had been concerned for her in ways that differed from that of a grandee and his concubine. But I kept these thoughts to myself. I visited Honorius's room in the morning of the fourth day. He had rallied during the night and was sitting up in his bed, conscious and propped up by many pillows. He was weak, but alert. Camilla stood beside him, spoon-feeding him broth from a bowl. Sophia was on the other side of the bed, dipping a cloth into cool water and wiping beads of sweat from his forehead. I'm grateful to see you well, my lord. It seems that it is not yet your time to take the ferry over the river Styx, to the realm of shadows. Honorius, pale and pallid, coughed weakly. This made him wince in pain. With effort, he raised his hand and nodded his head. I have your surgeons, great king, and they are indeed skilled in cheating death. I'm in your debt. I smiled. My surgeons are not the only reason for your return from the land of the living, my lord. You are being attended to by the most beautiful nursemaids in two empires, I said, gesturing to Sophia and Camilla. I am sure you would never leave such beauty for the land of shadows. Honorius managed a muffled laugh, which set off another round of coughing. You must be patient, my lord. Take your rest. Your ships and crews won a great victory this day. Aziz and his forces have been destroyed. The pirates are no more. The sea lanes are open. We will await the trade fleet from Egypt. Then my mission is accomplished, whispered Honorius. Calius has told me how you refused all of his entreaties to take cover behind the shield wall and lead the charge when your ship boarded the enemy triremes. You should not have done this. One must lead from the front, great king. I cannot take cover when the contest is in doubt. You know that the great Alexander himself always led from the front, said Honorius in a voice I could hardly hear. I nodded. Yes, even Alexander was foolhardy. The histories say that he suffered a similar wound mounting a battlement here in our lands 300 years ago. Honorius smiled. 
comparing me to the great conqueror does not in the least diminish the actual pain. My doctors can give you an extract of opium to lessen it, my lord. I will summon them. Honorius held up his free hand. No, great king, my mind must be clear. There's still much that needs to be done to prepare for the trade fleet. Ships must be sent out to search for them and bring them to this place. We must discuss the custom duties that you will impose and how our money and goods will be exchanged. All in good time, I said. You must gather your strength. Your able tribune, Calius, has already sent out your scout ships. In a few days' time, we will move the army up the river to my royal city of Minagara, and you will be more comfortable there. I took Sophia aside. You know, my lady, that he has suffered a grievous wound. It will take time and patience to recover. My surgeons tell me he will have limited use of his sword arm, and there's still great risk of infection from the wound in his lung. Camilla joined us as I was speaking. She spoke up. This will not sit well with him. He is a man of action. All his life he has made things happen, putting things in motion. It is not in his nature to sit back and watch things unfold. Then his greatest trials are before him, I said. Sophia bowed to me. Thank you, great king. Your doctor saved his life. We will do our part to nurse him to health. Several days later, the tribune Calius came to see his commander. My servants were making preparation to remove my court to Minagara, the new provincial capital. Honorius was still weak, but stable, under the care of my physicians. He was in good spirits and sat up in bed, attended, as always, by Sophia and Camilla, who doted on his every need. Calius entered the room and stood before his commander, holding out his right arm in salute. Ave Caesar! And hail his impurator, Paulus Fabius Honorius. Ave Caesar, replied Honorius weakly, raising his left hand. What news of the fleet? Calius, having now rested and wits recovered, replied, Dominus, our ships have crushed the enemy. Four of their number now lie in the harbor, captured. They're being refitted, and even now, the new crews are being ready to man them. Honorius turned to me. Great king, you now have a battle fleet at your disposal to keep the sea lanes open. Another painful coughing fit intervened. He laid back on his pillows, exhausted. Camilla brought a bowl of hot water laced with camphor to heal his breathing. Honorius gestured to Calius to come to his side. He grasped the tribune's forearm with his left hand. You've done well, Calius. Your service here will not be forgotten. I will send dispatches to the Emperor himself. You are destined to command more than a Marine cohort. Draw up these orders. During my convalescence, you are in command not only of the cohort, but the squadron as well. On behalf of Caesar, I pass the baton of Imperium to you. Use it wisely. Your orders shall bind all Roman forces in these lands. I am honored, Dominus, replied Calius. And what news is there, Tribune, of the trade ships? Our swiftest scouts have been sent out, great king. They are expected back today. Rolling thunder rumbled in the distance. Thick clouds piled high into massive canyons rolled in from the sea. The bellowing cloud tops, illuminated brilliant white by the westering sun, battled with dark and somber shadows below. The monsoons had returned. 
One of the fast galleys, now masted, sails full and running before the wind, swept into the port. Word came that the trade ships had been spotted and were just over the horizon. In the distance, white and purple sails caught the retreating rays of sunlight. They popped into view as if by magic, backgrounded by the dark and heavy rain clouds looming up behind them. Before long, more than a hundred could be seen, flying before the monsoon wind, banners streaming, distant blasts of trumpets sounded, answered by the louder blasts of the great horns from the harbor. Barbaricum exploded into a hive of activity. Masses of men, women, and children ran to the harbor to welcome the trade fleet, shouting and cheering, jumping and dancing with joy as the first raindrops began to fall. Gone was the sullenness of a conquered population of only a few days ago. Here was prosperity, here was hope, here was the expectation of better things to come. The rain had returned to refresh the land and trade had returned to make better lives. There was much to be done in those days. I marshaled my officials, Berths had to be arranged for all of these ships, the likes of which had not been seen for more than a lifetime. Cargoes had to be assigned to warehouses that had long stood empty. Inventories had to be taken and commerce organized. It was time to assemble all the people, our allies, tradesmen, Roman and Greek, merchants and servants, to bring order to the sudden deluge of trade. It was time to make a show and to assert my authority. I ordered all the Roman traders to assemble in the public place below the palace. All my courtiers, dressed in their finest silks, framed one side of the square. My best phalangists, armor gleaming, Sarissa standing upright at attention in a dense thicket, stood to another side. A row of war elephants, painted blue and red with polished bronze armor sparkling, stood on another. I stepped forward onto a raised dais in the center of the square and faced the foreign traders. In the first row of the Romans sat Sophia, Camilla, and the tribute, Calius, Strabo, and Nicanor. They were flanked by a multitude of captains and leaders of the Roman-Egyptian trade fleet and then a multitude of sailors, servants, and slaves who had come to see the spectacle. Drums sounded. I lifted my arm and heralds came forward to repeat my words in Greek to the crowd. I lowered my arm and pointed to my side. Let the scribes come forward and record for all to see the laws which I now proclaim. Let these statues and ordinances be inscribed on the tablets and placed in the marketplace here and in the royal city of Minagara and throughout all the lands of my kingdom, from the shores of this sea to the Hindu Kush, the roof of the world. I decree that all ships coming to this place shall unload their cargoes at the places my superintendent of commerce shall assign. Inventory shall be taken of all goods coming ashore. In this marketplace, my Antipala shall set his standard. You shall come to see him there, and he shall examine the quantity and quality of all goods coming to this place. My Antipala shall record all details and send reports which shall be kept at the palace in Minagara. Seals shall be set on all goods recorded in the warehouses. Value of these goods shall be set by the Antipala and his servants. Before the goods are removed from the warehouses, you shall pay one-fifth of its value in gold and silver to the Antipala, who shall then seal your goods with his own seal to ensure that these custom duties are paid. Only then shall you be free to move the goods from their warehouse here and send them by barge upriver to my royal city of Minagara. At the royal city, my superintendent of tolls shall be present and shall be found under his banner inside the gates of the city, along with his servants. 
There you shall take your trade goods under seal. He shall inspect the seals and ensure that no goods have been removed en route. His agents will record who the merchants are, where they come from, how much the merchandise they bring, and where they obtained their custom seals. These accounts will be compared with the records from Barbaricum to ensure that no taxes have been evaded. Should it be discovered that the merchants bringing the goods do so without a seal, then a double rate will be extracted. If counterfeit seals are discovered, then an 18-fold tax will be paid, or at the discretion of the inspector of tolls, the entire consignment of goods may be confiscated. You shall not sell weapons and armor to my subjects. Once through the gates of the royal city, your goods shall be placed under the banner of the toll house. There you will cry out the quantity and the price of your goods three times. Anyone at the place of the toll house banner may purchase the goods at the declared price. If the goods are sold for the stated price, then the tax will be collected. If not, tax will be paid on the declared value. I, Ganoferes, Gaspar of the House of Surin, King of Kings and Lord of a Thousand Castles, declare that these laws to be just before all presents. Hear and obey and you will prosper. Disobey and you will pay the penalty and be banished from these lands. So I have said, so let it be written, so let it be done. The days and weeks passed swiftly. The Romans and Egyptian merchants followed the codes I had laid down and moved their flood of wares to the royal city. A great emporium, second only to that of Alexandria, swelled with trade goods, and cargoes from all over India and as far away as China filled the marketplace to be bartered and traded in turn for the newfound treasures from the West. My officials kept track of all that transpired, and my chamberlain Pecoris read their reports to me. Roman cargoes are greatly sought after, great king, said Pecoris one day. The Roman merchants bring perfumes, glass vessels, and expensive silverware. Their workshops have developed ways of making crystal clear glass that is colored into beautiful hues. Roman artisans are skilled in glass blowing methods that allow thin walled vessels to be created. These are far better than those produced in India and China. But with the greatest treasures brought by the Romans and which is sought after by our traders is the red coral from the inner sea. This coral grows in branch-like patterns that look like bushes. When brought from the sea, it hardens into a smooth material that displays many colors, from pink to deep red. These branches are cut and polished to produce precious, valuable stones. The Romans say that this red coral comes from the blood of a female monster named Medusa, who was slain by the Greek hero Perseus. When Perseus severed her head, drops of blood fell into the sea, from which sprang the corals that hardened to stone when removed from the water. Our seers believe the coral to be a powerful talisman for warding off dangers. I have seen these coral stones. They are of great beauty. Issue a decree that the stores of this red coral be purchased and stockpiled in our royal treasury, I said. Our merchants also trade spices and drugs and bedallion, nard and lyceum from the Himalayas, costas from Kashmir and silks from China, indigo dyes, turquoise, and blue lapis lazuli crystals. Each of these trades generates taxes. Our coffers have been filled and your treasury overflows. But there is more, great king. The wealth from this trade has blessed your people's prosperity. They grow happy. Never have I seen them so content. Never have you been so loved by your subjects, said Pecoris. You have no enemies, and your realm is at peace for the first time in generations. K. 
Can you tell me why it is, Picores, that now, when I have crushed my enemies and given wealth to my subjects, do I yet feel no contentment? My spirit is restless. I have no heirs, no wives to share my life with. And even if I did, my spirit would still not rest. I feel there must be more, another purpose or journey that awaits me. The tiger in the forest is never at rest, sire, he said. It is not in his nature. Did I tell you, Picores, of my tiger's dream, and of the light in the forest, the child at its center, and the invitation of the luminous being? What am I to make of that? Am I being summoned to another destiny? What do you think, my friend? Sire, my counsel is that you go to Taxila and consult the seers there. There you may summon the seers and scholars and discover enlightenment and your new purpose. It is beyond my power to discern. Yes, perhaps I should go, faithful friend and servant. You speak truth. Make preparations to return to the capital. I will now join the beautiful philosopher from Alexandria and her guardian in our garden. I long for solace and yearn for their companionship. Later that evening, in the palace gardens, illuminated by torches and the light of a full moon, I reclined at dinner with Lady Sophia and her protector Camilla close by. We were finishing the remains of a meal of the finest delicacies my servants could prepare, sipping on the fine wine the Romans gifted to us. Musicians, out of sight, played softly on their flutes and lyres. Pray tell me, Lady Camilla, how fares our Lord Honorius? Do his wounds heal? Can we send him anything for his comfort? I asked. A shadow came over Camilla's face. He is challenged, great king. He is not content to rest and strains against forced inactivity. Outwardly, his wounds appear to be healing, but his breathing remains ever difficult. I fear that inwardly there is trouble. His color is pale, and the cough remains even after these many weeks. His strength is not returning. He cannot stand or walk for long before collapsing with weariness. Your physicians have done all they could, but I fear it may not be enough. Sophia looked away, holding back tears. I will see him on the morrow, I said. I have news that may cheer him, I turned to Sophia. And I have a promise to fulfill to you, my lady Philosophia. Within a fortnight, we shall embark on the journey upriver to my capital, Taxila, at the foot of the mountains. There you will see the splendor of our great university and meet our outstanding scholars and monks. There you will teach in the rooms of our great libraries and university, as you did in Alexandria. I looked at Camilla. There, Lady Camilla, you will meet our holy people, servants of the Buddha, and we shall take Honorius with us, for they are skilled in the healing arts. The rainy season is almost over, and the mountain breezes will freshen the air. The journey is a long one, but we will go comfortably by royal barge. Honorius will have all the attention and attendance he shall need. I think this will raise his spirits, don't you? I gently grasped Sophia's hand. And my lady, perhaps we shall hear something of your Adam on the way. Sophia smiled, but demurely averted her eyes. I had a strange dream last night. At least I thought it was a dream. I thought I was awake. I looked out to the balcony. I heard the sound of wind 
and the flapping of great wings. A noble bird, an eagle, alighted on the stone railing. I sat up. Its eyes, they locked on me. I felt as if they were looking into my very soul. I felt a shock burning throughout my body. I could have been afraid, and I should have been, but I was not. I felt I knew this eagle. Somehow, it was familiar. Then with a leap and stroke of its wings, it dove off the balustrade. I ran over to where it had been, but there was nothing. She raised her eyes and looked at me. What does this mean? This is a message from the gods, I said. Something noble is coming. Pecoris appeared before us. He bowed to Camilla and Sophia. Forgive my intrusion, great king, but you have a strange visitor. He claims to have come here from Taxila. He begs to speak with you. He is a Greek, and he has brought a young companion with him. Do you wish to see them now? A Greek? From Taxila? Not unheard of in the past, but very rare these days. Well, this may be interesting. Perhaps he is a new adventure for us, I said, looking to Sophia. See, he must have something to do with your phantom eagle. Pecoris returned with his charges. In strode a rotund, shaggy, black-haired, and thickly bearded man, dressed in a lavish red, red silk caftan. He was short, very stocky, with stout legs the size of tree trunks rooted to the marble floor. He wore snakeskin boots and carried a walking stick topped with a very large red gemstone. His thick neck was draped with gold chains and his wrists cuffed with gold and bejeweled amulets. He wore large gold rings on each finger set with rubies. A broad smile revealed several gold teeth that glittered in the torchlight. This extraordinary man doffed a red silk cat with one hand and swept it in a single motion off his head and swept the floor. He bowed deeply. He turned and bowed the same way to Sophia, who sprang to her feet, hands to her face, as she ran to this man, throwing her arms around him in joy. Theron Simonides, oh, the gods be praised, she cried. Two steps behind him was a tall, angular youth with skin the color of copper. He stood quietly in the shadows, a broad smile showing strong white teeth. He was clad like a Scythian in gold scale armor, a red silk cape and trousers belted at the waist. On his left hand, gloved to the elbow, sat the most magnificent eagle I have ever seen with a leather cap on its head, covering its eyes. Sophia broke free from Theron and rushed to the boy. She grasped his shoulders and held him out at arm's length, looking at him up and down. Tears streamed down her cheeks. By Athena, by Hera, can this be our little Abu, keeper of the ferrets and physician's apprentice I see before me? You've grown so much, I hardly recognize you. The boy straightened himself up and cleared his throat. <clears throat> I am no longer Abu, my lady, but am called Targetus of the Eagle Clan by my people. I am a warrior and I serve the queen of the Masajite. He turned to look at the eagle perched on the T-shaped stick held with his left hand. And this is Zephira, queen of eagles and hunter of wolves. Tarchetus of the eagle clan, warrior, queen.
queen? Sophia was struggling to take this in. But where are your two little friends? They are safe, my lady. But I gave them away when I became a man, said the boy. Sophia turned to me. I saw the quizzical look on her face. Great king, please forgive me. These are long lost friends. This is Theron Simonides, merchant and promoter of entertainments. And this is Abukar from Egypt, apprentice to Adam, the one I seek. And this great bird, she turns to me with astonishment on her face, is the eagle I saw in my dream. It was no dream, my lady, said Targetus. I sent Zephira to find you. I see through her eyes, and there you were. And so we have come. Sophia put her hands to her face and sobbed with joy. And what of Adam? What news of him? Tell me, she said. Theron stepped forward and embraced her. He is well, my lady. He is in Taxila and waiting there for you and the queen and the king consort of the Masajite host, along with some of their hand-picked warriors. Taxila? Queen? King consort? Has the earth shifted off its axis? Do the stars still journey across the sky? So much has changed. Sophia had to sit down. She looked at Theron, and her eyes glistened with tears. Is Adam the king consort? She said, voice quavering. Theron knelt at her feet. I will tell you all, gentle lady. Do not despise me when you hear of how I conspired to see him exiled. I did him a grievous wrong. He has come through battle, fire, and smoke, and the heavens themselves have sent messengers of light to bring him back to you. I vowed to take no rest until he is restored to you. And by Zeus, I tell you, this was all meant to be. Targetus turned to me. And these messengers shall summon you as well, great king. They will send a star, a wondrous light, to draw you to the west. You shall see said Targetus, a look of ecstasy glowing on his face. I have beheld a child of light in a dream, I said, and a luminous being beckoning me to come to them. But where is this child? How do we find him? Music for Chapter 4 The following from Epidemic Sound Army of Angels by Edgar Hopp Serene Journey by Palace on Wheels A Hero Will Know by Bonnie Grace Last Hero Standing by Dream Cave Beat to Quarters by Bonnie Grace The Odyssey Ahead by Dream Cave Yutataka by Sayuri Harashi Egnell, Forging an Empire by Christopher Moe Ditlevson, Midnight Melodies by Palace on Wheels, Godsend by Johannes Bernloff, Mr. Payne by Lennon Hutton, 
The following are from other independent sources. Twins Music, Dandelion Field, Vital Stomp, Myth by Arthur Unknown, Ed Records, A New Quest, Archangel Chronicles 2 by Raymond Collati, copyright 2024, all rights reserved. 